Today on Built to Last, we visit the mother of all trade shows. We essentially build the world's largest factory in two weeks. And old buildings get a new life. We started looking around and saw this empty building. Do not pass go. Go directly to jail. It's time to watch Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and Armstrong Ceilings. Faster, easier, better. Hi, and welcome to Built to Last. I'm Monica Peterson. And I'm Mark Nilsson. Chicago is one of the largest trade show destinations in the world. On this episode of Built to Last, we'll see how a bustling convention center was the catalyst for a neighborhood transformation that includes restaurants, hotels, and a brand new sports arena. And then Chicago's architecture is second to none. We'll visit an abandoned city lockup that's being transformed into a space for children to experience the arts. Chicago has an amazing history of doing big things, all the way back to Daniel Burnham, you know, make no small plans. We had the Columbian Exposition, we had the Century of Progress World's Fair, we've had, uh, we're the center of commerce and industry in the United States, and it seemed at the time only natural to want to be able to construct a facility that would continue to bring exhibitors and meeting attendees to Chicago. Mindful that the Century of Progress Exposition had attracted 1,500 conventions and 1.5 million visitors over two years at the height of the Great Depression, Chicago Tribune publisher Robert R. McCormick unsuccessfully advocated for a lakefront venue for years. Finally, in 1960, Mayor Richard J. Daley opened a 360,000 square foot exhibition center on the lakefront that bore McCormick's name. When I was a kid, I spent a lot of time going to McCormick Place with my dad. We went to World of Wheels, we went to the Chevy Vet Fest, and we, of course, went to the auto show. The first Chicago auto show opened its doors in 1901 at the Chicago Coliseum. By the time it moved to McCormick Place in 1961, it was a city institution. Everybody thinks of the auto show in Chicago. Taking my kids to the auto show was a they loved it and look forward to it every year. It's the largest in the, in the nation. It brings uh, over a million visitors a year to McCormick Place to um, look at the best in, in, in class and all the in the automotive industry. Particularly my oldest son, there was a race car there and he, Dale Earnhardt, and uh, he was enthralled. This year, I was able to bring uh, my daughter and my son. And my son sat in every car he could. But I think a lot of people also associate Chicago with a number of other meetings. The houseware show, the restaurant show, as well as some of the big manufacturing shows like IMTS. The IMTS show moved to Chicago post-World War II as the manufacturing base of the United States moved more toward the Midwest. That is still the case today. Even though manufacturing is expanded through the United States, it is primarily in a 300-mile radius of Chicago. McCormick Place is the largest convention venue in that area and has been IMTS's hosts since 1972. Chicago is so unique because we are a massive, diverse economy. We have manufacturing, we've got pharmaceutical, we've got healthcare, we've got culinary, we've got all these different kinds of industries that really, at the end of the day, contribute to increased attendance and easier access for exhibitors. We essentially build the world's largest factory in two weeks that cannot be done without an extremely skilled workforce. The way we describe things at McCormick Place is organized chaos. When a show's moving in, you can't even imagine the amount of freight and, and things that come into the building. The carpenters do the carpet, uh, and we build the structures. Each show is unique. Um, I enjoy them because there's people that come from all over the world. From the welcome, from the first day we moved into the empty floor and trying to get all these machines in that are around me, it certainly takes a lot of effort. And McCormick Place and the unions around us have been excellent in supporting and educating us on how to do that quickly and safely. It is satisfying when you see the finished product of, of what it started to, to what it became. Uh, it's similar to construction when you're building a building. 
it, it's the same thing, but it's just such a short period of time, and then you take everything apart and do it again the next week. Well, the meetings industry not only generates tax revenues, it generates jobs. IMTS employs hundreds of skilled laborers on their move-in, their build-up, the running of the show. Say the numbers of, of, of men working on those shows, it can vary from anywhere from 10 to over 1,000. As much business is transacted here on the show floor as it is in the evenings in Chicago's restaurants, in the lobbies, in the bars, and the uh, nightclubs. I used to play for 27 years right here on the south side, a couple of miles away, 87 Kimbar. On a typical Monday, you would see, it wasn't unusual to see more Japanese people than African American. Chicago is a full experience for our visitors, and that's something they look forward to. McCormick Place's footprint has expanded a lot since 1960. The original building was open for a short period of time and then it burnt down. And then the then Mayor Daley um, got behind the rebuild and they rebuilt McCormick Place um, alongside the lake. We had so much activity going in that original building after it was rebuilt that eventually we had to come across Lakeshore Drive, we had to come across the railroad tracks, and that's now where you have uh, the north and south building. And then from there, they moved across Martin Luther King Drive to uh, build what we call the West, uh, the West Building in the Corporate Center. So the one thing that the MPA has been very good at over the years is really analyzing what we need to have on this campus in order to stay ahead of the competition. And it became very clear that in order to attract new meetings of the future, as well as continue to serve our existing customer base, that we needed to have some different kinds of assets. We were rolling a thousand tons down a city street. And the guys, you just depend on this one guy with the remote control moving this thing. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. Most of us have moved homes, which means we're moving into a new house. But let's take a look at what happens when it's the house that actually moves. <laughs> McCormick Place has been around for a long time, and uh, it's been expanding for years, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's really considered one of the largest convention centers in the nation. But interestingly enough, for most of its incarnation, they didn't want to do anything outside the convention center. That we needed to have some different kinds of assets. Number one, we needed another hotel. That was something we heard loud and clear from all the customers who come down here. And we needed a flexible venue that could be used for corporate meetings, could be used for convocations, could be used for concerts. And that led, as well as our partnership with DePaul, to the construction of the Wind Trust Arena. Featuring an NCAA basketball court, the new home of the Blue Demons will have 10,000 seats and is designed to easily accommodate concerts as well as large corporate meetings. While the arena is attached to the convention center, it's equally accessible to the surrounding neighborhood. When you talk about development, um, especially the expansion of McCormick Place, you know, one of the biggest questions is how do we make sure that the few remaining historic houses survive? We, we want and we need to be a good neighbor. And that's something that we keep in mind and it becomes more and more important as there's more development around the campus itself. We have a very important historic residential neighborhood that is our neighbor to the north. And that's the Prairie Avenue District. Some of the most significant 
people that helped build Chicago lived right here on Prairie Avenue. People like Marshall Field and George Pullman and John G. Glesner lived here. Philip Armour, the people of the, the, the stockyards, the meat packers, you name it, the movers and shakers all set up right here on Prairie Avenue. Um, and many of these industries were dominated from this street. Added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1972, the Prairie Avenue Historical District includes houses on the south 1800 and 1900 blocks of Prairie Avenue. One of the big buzzwords in architecture is sustainability or adaptive reuse. The Reese House was the only remaining structure on Prairie Avenue between 21st and Cermak. It wasn't the most significant home on Prairie Avenue, but it survived. So the house actually could not be demolished. It's on the National Register um, of Historic Landmarks in Illinois and national level. So the MPAA, in conjunction with the city and Illinois, um, decided to relocate it. And it was a fascinating process that we as a community embraced and appreciated. This is the largest house that has been moved in the past 15 years. So it's not something that anybody has done, especially in the city of Chicago. So uh, it was definitely a challenge. We probably took about six to eight months pre-planning this project. It was a wood structure, but brick, masonry bearing exterior walls. So we put a skeleton or a structure around the house, both vertically and horizontally, kind of holding the structure together. And then we tied that down into the main beams and cross beams. So excavated around the perimeter, you basically put what you call the main beams. They run the entire length of the house from front to back. And then you have cross beams. So cross beams run the width of the house. We picked it up from below the first floor up. We did not take the basement with. We jacked up those main beams. There was probably 40 jacks on this project, but they all are tied to one machine that they all lift at the same exact time. Basically, they pull those main beams up, uh, all the floor joists, and then the house physically raises up. At that point, we then transferred the main beams onto a set of dollies. Each dolly has eight wheels and there was a total of 240 wheels underneath this house. The weight of the house was 780 tons, and then there was another 200 tons of equipment associated with you know, that skeleton and the wheels. So we're, we were rolling 1,000 tons down a city street. And the guys, you just depend on this one guy with the remote control moving this thing. We moved it two blocks the first day. That took about five hours. We then parked the house in the middle of Prairie Avenue overnight, and then the next day, on day two of the move path, we physically backed the house in and kind of, we describe it as parallel parking it between two adjacent houses. Carpenters were there on a daily basis, um, helping with the move itself, preparing the move path, uh, bringing the house into its final location. Once it was in its final position, the operator who was actually moving the house sounded a horn, and uh, the entire crowd cheered. The Reese House weighs 762 tons, the same as 1,270 elephants rolling down the street. Well, McCormick Square is named for the convention center. There's plenty more to do in this exciting new neighborhood. Let's check it out. Halfway to completion, there's a celebration at McCormick Square. Wintrust Financial Corporation has secured the naming rights to the new arena. So we're a year away from completion, and with construction moving on time and on budget, we have to thank all who have contributed to developing this facility. It's important to keep in mind that the arena would not have been possible without a partnership with DePaul University that was looking to bring back a new home for men's and women's basketball. We're so fortunate that they were able, they provided half the capital cost for building the arena, yet they're still a tenant. And it allowed us to have this great new state-of-the-art facility that not only accommodates sports, it's going to accommodate concerts. And last, and certainly not least, all the men and women who come out here every day to make this project happen. A big thank you to everybody. It's incredibly important to have a well-trained labor force. And uh, you can say it in four words, on time, on budget and the quality of the construction is fantastic. You see now this major expansion. You have not only the new DePaul Stadium, the 10,000 seat event center, you also have the new Marriott Marquis. Well, the Marriott Marquis Chicago is going to be the only marquee in the region, 
It is 1,205 rooms. It's got over 90,000 square feet of meeting space. It's gonna have a spectacular 33rd floor rooftop event space. And it's married together with the Historic American Book Company building, which will house meeting rooms, a restaurant, and offices. As a result of the expansion on the campus, we've created over a thousand construction jobs. You have two more hotels announced that are on Cermak Road. So clearly there is a major emphasis now on growing um, not only places for people to stay around the convention center, but Motor Row. Just around the corner from McCormick Square is a legacy of beautiful reinforced concrete buildings known as Motor Row. From around 1900 up until 1936, the automobile industry took over South Michigan Avenue. From single level showrooms all the way up to grand four story showrooms, there were something like, um, I want to say 115 different automobile makers showcasing their automobiles on South Michigan Avenue. But as time went on, the retail auto business went horizontal and moved out of the downtown area. And so by 1950, all of a sudden, there was a new movement taking over South Michigan Avenue. And it was the birth of the electric blues. Chicago blues was created by the guys that used to play Delta blues. So they brought their blues from a lot of time, mostly rural, Mississippi, and the sound changed with the advent of the, uh, the Fender bass, the Fender amps, and it became electrified, and it echoed the sounds of Chicago. Probably one of the most famous recording companies was Chess Records, and the Chess Brothers opened up the Chess Records around 1950 in one of the old automobile showrooms. Chess Records was the number one, uh, probably the most successful, and, and had the, the you know the longest success. I think the Stones even cut a few sides on Chess Records. So before Motown, there was Record Row, and but unfortunately, Record Row kind of ended by the 19, early 1970s. I looked at the Billboard charts, and you look at in the 1950s where. Muddy Waters, Little Walter, Sonny Boy Williams, and Jimmy Reed, they were at the top of the, the charts. And then when you get to the 60s, you start seeing the blues start disappearing from the, the playlists. Then the, the kind of area went through kind of an industrial period, from 1960s and 70s into the 80s. And by the early 90s, all of a sudden, we started to see the beginnings of a new residential development. We keep seeing new assets in the neighborhood pop up as they recognize that more and more people are coming not only to visit, but to live down here. New restaurants have come. The idea of a McCormick Square that uh, furnishes a resurgence of uh, the golden age of uh, clubs and restaurants is a wonderful idea. The Motor Row Entertainment District directly to our west is nothing but scaffolding and work being done right now in anticipation of new restaurants and uh, entertainment venues coming to the neighborhood to really complement the campus. They're, they're changing that neighborhood and, and it will be more of a destination for people to come and, and not just experience the show but experience Chicago. We just completed an updated economic impact study and McCormick Place and McCormick Square Campus, including the hotels and the upcoming event centers, are responsible for about 15,000 permanent jobs in the economy and $1.8 billion in economic impact. That's, that's a tremendous amount of taxes that goes back to both the local economy and the state of Illinois specifically. To have this economic engine in the middle of all this regional uh, and local residential growth is going to mean better retail, better commercial, more office jobs, more new construction. It has a multiplier effect on everything that happens in the area. And I, for one, am very happy to be a set resident of the South Loop. There were desks, there were chairs, there were wanted posters on the walls. It was, you know, it was like they just got up and walked away. Stabilo for over 125 years has led the industry in measuring and leveling. Still manufactured in Germany since 1865, tradesmen rely on Stabila every day for its precision and durability. We continue to revolutionize the way we build with our lasers, levels, and laser distance measuring tools on commercial and residential job sites around the world. Stabila, 
how true pros measure. Meet the new family of Blaze Laser Measures from Bosch. Go ahead, turn it on and start measuring. It's that simple. The Blaze family offers a wide range of functions to tackle any measuring job. Extend your reach with accuracy up to a 16th of an inch. With Bluetooth enabled devices, easily transfer measurements to your smartphone or tablet with free Bosch apps. Reach farther, work faster, and stay accurate with the Bosch Blaze family of laser measures. Measure on. As Americans, we never give up, and we certainly don't give up on old architecture. Here's a story about how we are rehabbing, restoring, and repurposing some of our oldest and most intriguing buildings. Well, I've passed this building, I don't know how many times, and I've always wondered what it was. Built on the shore of Lake Michigan in 1926, the Elks National Memorial was renovated in 2013. I love the look on people's faces when they come in here and their jaw drops. And a lot of people refer to it as a veterans memorial or a war memorial, but it's actually a memorial to peace. It was completed after World War I, and at that time that people thought that was the war to end all wars. The oak in here was shipped over from Great Britain. This is from old growth uh, oak that uh, the forests are gone. Everywhere you look, there's some type of intricate detail. The wood carvings, they're just so intricate. The ceilings, definitely the ceilings. The muscular babies. You're not going to find anything like this being built today. The Yale apartments were luxury accommodations for visitors to the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. The outside of it is very beautiful with the curved windows, um, the turrets. I knew somewhat what to expect, but then walking in and getting the full effect in person, there's no substitute. We've taken advantage of the atrium. As you can see, we have some beautiful plant life in here, and um, it's just warm, inviting. We you know, converted to 69 one-bedroom units for seniors, 55 and older. It is affordable housing, and this is kind of a special place. It's historically significant, and the fact that it's not on the north side, but that it's located in Englewood gave me a chance to see a part of the city that I don't normally get to see. The Colvin House has sat on North Sheridan Road since the turn of the century. I've passed by this building for years. I've always admired it and uh, daydreamed about living there. <laughs> I first saw this online, and then I came and looked at the house and absolutely fell in love with it in person. It's a 1909 building. Uh, George Mayer was the architect. Uh, and then in the 1920s and 30s, the owners of the residence added a whole lot of layers to the interior. Even a quirky bathroom. That bathroom was spectacular. The color of the tiles and even the little detail with the little floral tiles around the inside and the outside of the shower area and the archway on the tub, the length of the tub, just being able to get inside, that was so exciting. I'm sad to say that it's in such disrepair. We'll be using it to be a shared workspace, meeting place, and small event space. So it'll be something that the community can use. And that commitment to restoring and repurposing buildings for community use is on theatrical display across Chicago in the West Loop. For 11 years, we have been moving from space to space. So we have performed in about 10 different venues and we needed a home. In December 2013, the city of Chicago closed the 12th District Police Station. When most people saw this police station abandoned at first, they really didn't see the potential. We started looking around and saw this empty building. And we just couldn't believe that it was just sitting here. There are a lot of children in this neighborhood that could benefit from this type of facility. So uh, having kids of uh, my own that never had a chance to be at a place like this, it really makes it uh, more appreciated. Kind of a unique thing that we're taking something where at the lowest of the lowest of society was held and kept and now we're going to be bringing the kids and teaching them something. When I first walked into this job, I walked in through the front doors and there were desks, there were chairs, there were wanted posters on the walls. It was, you know, it was like they just got up and walked away. The cell block itself 
stayed about 10 foot off of each wall and about six foot from the ceiling. So it was a complete steel cage right out in the middle of the floor. So you could look down each aisle over the top of it and make sure nobody was breaking out. Each cell had two benches, had a sink in a corner and a toilet. It's an old building and they tried to keep a lot of the historical uh, features left in it, um, such as stair rails, different walls, things in that nature. The front stairway, it's the old blue Chicago police blue tile. You got two studs and a zip it. There are different applications where you have to be very careful with the old existing structure not to damage that to preserve those uh, sort of things. As with any theater, the sound criteria is, is, is critical, so um, now you're changing a, a jail cell into a performance space, which making sure that the acoustics and the sound and lighting criteria are now theatrical lighting. On the upstairs, there are classrooms and workshops. In the northeast classroom, they're going to have trapeze. If you look up in the ceiling, you'll see steel anchor points in the ceilings. You know, the arts for kids, funding has been postponed and eliminated, so this project here is kind of exciting. Today, I thank you all so much for joining me at what was once the 12th District Police Station, and now is forever our first permanent home. This organization has came to the community. They embrace the community. They offered so much to so many other schools. Kids can come here and watch shows and be inspired, and they can like do acting and stuff like that. You can um, make something and put it out in, out there, and you can see people can see it. I think it was really good for the neighborhood to have a community theater, a not-for-profit organization in the ward here, rather than uh, another building high rise. Taking old buildings and reusing them is, you know, something I've been part of for years. It's that whole idea of recycle and reuse. I think especially theater is all about transformation. It's nice to have new construction, but it's just glass and steel and it has no character. So I love the character of old buildings. You get a chance to feel the what it was like back in the 20s or 30s or 40s. Look around you. I mean, if this were left to uh, to rot, what would, you know, what a loss it would be. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. And remember, doing it right costs less than doing it over. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Any idea why they have a dinosaur in here? There's a dinosaur? There is.